everyone for learning outcome number three of module eight. We finally got to what we wanted, right? Muscle contraction and relaxation. The sequence of events that will result in the contraction of an individual muscle fiber begins with a single signal, which is the presence of the neurotransmitter acetylcholine from the motor neuron that's innervating this specific muscle fiber. So if we come over here to this image, we can clearly see that this would be the axon. At the end of the axon, you have the axon terminal. Then at the axon terminal, you have the axon terminal buttons. And these terminal buttons together with the muscle is going to form what we call the neuromuscular junction. So there's going to be an action potential that's coming down this axon. And when it reaches the motor unit, it will do a few things. So first thing that happens is, which we haven't talked about yet, is that when the action potential arrives over here to this synaptic end bulb, it will cause calcium to enter, and the entry of calcium will trigger the synaptic vesicles that contain the neurotransmitter to be pushed down and the membrane of these synaptic vesicles will fuse with the membrane of the terminal end button or the synaptic end bulb and release the neurotransmitters that are inside the synaptic vesicles. These neurotransmitters are specifically acetylcholine for muscle contraction and they will bind on the membrane of the muscle, which is called the motor end plate, to specific receptors of acetylcholine. This binding will trigger sodium to enter into the muscle, and this will cause depolarization of this membrane and therefore excite the membrane. The excitement of this membrane causes an action potential to travel along these invaginations of the muscle membrane that's called a T-tubule and therefore this will cause the release of calcium into the sarcoplasm or the inside of the muscle cell. Now the presence of calcium inside of the muscle cell is important because it will be the one that will bind to troponin. Remember troponin is the one that's holding the tropomyosin in place and covering the myosin binding sites on the actin. But once you have calcium, calcium will then bind to troponin. As it binds to troponin, troponin allows the tropomyosin to change its conformation and therefore expose the myosin binding sites on the actin filaments. And this exposure will then permit the myosin head to be able to bind to the myosin binding sites on the actin. And there are more steps that occur here, but in summary, what we want to know is that once the thick filament and the thin filament, once they're able to connect, this will cause a muscle contraction. So you can see there's going to be a shortening of the muscle fiber, and therefore this will produce a tension that will cause the muscle to contract. The other thing that needs to happen is that you have to have a molecule of ATP because this requires energy. And we will talk more about the breakdown of ATP into ADP and a phosphate on the next slide. But for you to have muscle relaxation, then the two things that cause muscle contraction need to be removed. And the two things are calcium and ATP. Therefore, calcium is going to be important to be reuptaken into the T tubules. And also, the ATP is required to release the myosin head from the myosin binding site on the actin filament. And when this occurs, the myosin head gets released and therefore it relaxes and the muscle is able to stretch back and relax. Now let's talk a little bit about this cross bridge formation, which basically is when the myosin head binds to the actin molecules. 
Remember that we had on the myosin head two binding sites, one that was called the actin binding site and one that was called the ATP binding site. Therefore, when the actin binding site of the myosin head is able to bind with the actin molecule, it creates this cross bridge. But for this to occur, the first thing that needs to happen is the presence of calcium. So the calcium, again, is coming from the T-tubules. Once calcium enters, it will bind to troponin right over here. Once it binds to troponin, it allows the tropomyosin to change its conformation and release the myosin binding sites on the actin molecule. Now, like I said, the myosin head also includes an ATP binding site in addition to an ATPase, which is an enzyme that breaks down the ATP into adenosine diphosphate, or ADP, and a phosphate group. And this reaction is going to not only reorient, but also energize the myosin head. So it will give the myosin head energy to be able to attach the myosin head to the actin molecule. Therefore, we can say that this energized myosin head is going to attach to the myosin binding site on the actin. And in this process, it will release this phosphate group. When the myosin heads attach to the actin during contraction, this will be referred to as the cross bridge. After the cross bridge forms, then we're going to have what we call the power stroke. And during the power stroke, the site on the cross bridge where ADP is still bound will open. And as a result of this, the cross bridge will be able to rotate and release this ADP. And therefore, the cross bridge will generate enough force as it rotates towards the center of the sarcomere. And this will cause the sliding of the thin filament past the thick filament toward the M line, toward the middle of the sarcomere. At the end of this power stroke, what's going to happen is that the cross bridge will remain firmly attached to the actin until it binds another molecule of ATP. So ATP will bind to the ATP binding site on the myosin head and the myosin head will then be able to detach from actin. So the detachment only occurs when you have another molecule of ATP arriving. And in this way, the contraction cycle is able to repeat as now you have a new ATP, and therefore the ATPase is able to break down this newly bound molecule of ATP, and it continues as long as ATP is available and as long as the calcium levels near the thin filament is sufficiently high to be able to bind troponin and release the myosin binding sites on the actin. With regards to the sliding filament model of muscle contraction, what's going to occur is that the thin filaments are going to move towards the midline, so the M line. The other thing that's important to notice is that the thick filaments, they stay in place. They do not move. The only thing that moves are the thin filaments. And one thing that you can notice is that the eye band, which is this band right over here, that's made up of only thin filaments. And the way that I remember that eye band is made up of thin filaments is that the letter I is very thin. So that's made up of thin filaments. Notice how the eye band is going to become smaller when you have a contracted muscle right over here. However, the A band, which is the band that contains the myosin filaments or the thick filaments, is going to remain the same size, meaning that what's moving is or are the thin filaments towards the M line. Let's look at the structures that we have here. This would be part of a muscle fiber. Surrounding the muscle fiber is the sarcolemma, so the membrane. There are invaginations of the membrane that are called T-tubules that come down. And around the T-tubules, 
we're going to have these two terminal cisterns, which are enlargements of the sarcoplasmic reticulum right over here. If you recall from the previous slides, for muscle contraction to occur, what do you need? You need calcium, right? And calcium is going to be stored in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. From the sarcoplasmic reticulum, it's going to go into these terminal cisterns, which form like a sandwich of the T-tubule right in the middle. So on this side, we can see the two cisterns, terminal cisterns on each side, the T-tubule in the middle, and the calcium will go from the sarcoplasmic reticulum and pass all the way to the T-tubule, where calcium will then come out through these pores in the sarcolemma and then be used for muscle contraction. Now these three structures, which are one central T-tubule squished between two terminal cisterns is what we call a triad. Therefore, we can add that the sarcoplasmic reticulum is the one that's going to be responsible for the regulation of the intracellular levels of calcium, as it is the place where calcium is stored. ATP supplies the energy for muscle contraction to take place, as we have seen on the previous slides. And in addition to its direct role in the cross-bridge cycle, ATP also provides the energy for the active transport of calcium pumps into the sarcoplasmic reticulum, as we saw on the previous slide. And the muscle contraction, it does not occur without sufficient amounts of ATP. In fact, the amount of ATP that's stored in the muscle is very, very low and only sufficient to power just a few seconds worth of contractions. So as it is broken down, ATP must therefore be regenerated and replaced quickly to allow for this sustained contraction. And there are three mechanisms by which the ATP can be regenerated in muscle cells, which are creatine phosphate metabolism, anaerobic glycolysis, and aerobic respiration. On the first image, we can see over here that some ATP is going to be stored in a resting muscle, like we said, and as the contraction starts, it is used up in seconds because there's very little of it. However, if you combine ATP with creatine, it will give you creatine phosphate and ADP, and this will then give you creatine kinase, which can be broken down into creatine and ATP. So there is your form of energy for muscle contraction using creatine phosphate. As the ATP produced by creatine phosphate is depleted because it is used very fast, the muscles will then turn to glycolysis as an ATP source. So glycolysis, as we can see over here, is an anaerobic process, which means that it's not oxygen dependent, and it will break down glucose or sugar to produce ATP. However, glycolysis cannot generate ATP as quickly as creatine phosphate. So this means that the switch to glycolysis will result in a slower rate of ATP availability to the muscle. And the sugar that's used in glycolysis can be provided by either blood glucose or by metabolizing glycogen that is stored in the muscle. And this breakdown of one glucose molecule will produce two ATPs and two molecules of pyruvic acid, as we see over here, which can be used in either aerobic respiration or when oxygen levels are low, it will be converted into lactic acid. In other words, if oxygen is going to be available, pyruvic acid is used in aerobic respiration. However, if oxygen is not available, then the pyruvic acid is going to be converted to lactic acid, which may contribute to muscle fatigue, which is not a very good option. Lastly, we have what we call aerobic respiration, which is the breakdown of glucose or other nutrients in the presence of oxygen. And this will produce carbon dioxide together with water, 
but more importantly, ATP. And approximately 95% of the ATP that's required for, for the resting muscles or the muscles that are moderately active is going to be provided by this aerobic respiration, which takes place in the mitochondria. So the inputs of aerobic respiration includes glucose that's going to be circulating in the bloodstream. It's going to include pyruvic acid as well as fatty acids. And this aerobic respiration is much more efficient than the anaerobic glycolysis as it produces 36 ATPs per molecule of glucose versus two from the glycolysis. However, this aerobic respiration needs a lot of oxygen, so it cannot be sustained without the steady supply of oxygen to the skeletal muscle, and it's going to be much slower if it does not have the oxygen that it needs. To compensate for this, the muscles, they do store a small amount of excess oxygen in proteins that are called myoglobin, and this will allow for more efficient muscle contractions and less fatigue. So there is a way around the fatigue that's produced by the production of lactic acid. In addition, if you do a lot of aerobic training, this also increases the efficiency of the circulatory system so that you have enough oxygen that can be supplied to the muscles for longer periods of time. So the more training you get, the better your body gets with storing oxygen.